So today's guest on our conference call is John Kessel, and John is the uh, USA Volleyball Director of Sport Development. He is also their liaison for Disabled Sport, Deaf Olympics, SIT Volleyball. He's uh, on the Technical Commission at the, uh, for the IF. And John also consults with a variety of organizations across all sports. If you spend time at all with John, uh, you'll you know you'll hear stories about him talking to the Cleveland Indians and Pittsburgh Pirates and all kinds of other uh, teams and sports and uh, lacrosse as well. And uh, with that, John, I'm gonna go ahead and one, I'm gonna unmute you first. And oops. Oh, Sorry about that. <laughs> You're unmuted now. Sorry about that. I uh, took me a second to I, I double click by accident there. And now I'm going to turn this over to you. And the floor is all yours. So I assume you can see this okay, Sam and all. I can see it. I'm assuming everyone else can too. So I'm gonna do this in a way that hopefully you guys could use and learn to present this idea of practicing for practice or performance, which came from the late Dr. Richard Schmidt when he visited the USOC probably about 10 years ago, maybe less actually, and talked to about 38 Olympic sports winter and summer about learning. And they had uh, Ericsson there. This is kind of when the 10,000 hour thing came out. And Dr. Schmidt listen to many sports deliver drills, drills which we consider the drugs of coaches, and he kept saying, it sounds to me like you're practicing for practice and not for performance. You're, you're practicing to look good and not to be in the chaos of the game and the randomness and, the, and learn to read in the reality and what we also call train in reality. So, the title is an homage to Dr. Schmidt, whose last book, Motor Learning and Performance Principles to Practice, uh, fifth edition, is still one of the top five go-to books for me. Um, that said, I also have a brand new book about the cortex, the performance cortex by uh, Zach Schoenenbrum, who's been working in the baseball area, how neuroscience is redefining athletic genius. It came out April 17th, and it's a must-read, I think, for those of you listening in, um, out there uh, with some great ideas about essentially the stuff of how do you learn faster, which is really what this is about. So when we teach the science of motor learning, it's, it's not about right or wrong. It's about more effective and more efficient. And... My mentor that did this, of course, is uh, Dr. Carl McGowan, um, who passed away about a year and a half ago, um, Professor Emeritus of Motor Learning. He's the reason that volleyball's won so many medals. Um, he, in the 70s, started to change the men's program to be more science-based instead of uh, tradition and drill-based. Uh, we won a gold medal in 84. We won a gold medal in 88 because of those changes. We won another medal in 2008. We have no pro league in this country for men or women, and yet the men have won about over half a dozen gold medals in the Olympics and world championships and everything. And Carl's always been the quiet guy behind getting the program to follow the science and the research of how do we learn faster. Um, also, there's a... Facebook vo uh, Volleyball Coaches and Trainers group that we founded with just a few people at the beginning. It's a closed group. It's now over 17,000 members. And our motto there is something I would share for all of your sports to use when they have a, a group discussing things, and that is say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't be mean when you say it. When you're mean when you say it in our world, we literally um, say to you, warning one, and then after that, goodbye. So. So the first question is, who is this? And in a nutshell, this is the ideal coach um, who is really going to get the kids to have the intrinsic feedback rather than the coach's mouth, which is called extrinsic feedback. Your feedback is incredibly important. 
the feedback is very important. But I'm going to ask you to sort of change your feedback from telling them what to do, which is the least learned, worst way to figure out new problem-solving new things, to the way you learn to ride a bike, which when we jump down to that, you know, how did you learn to ride a bike question, um, that's intrinsically learned. So on the scale of what my role is as a coach, I can be the teller, demander, commander, I'm head coach, tell, do what I say, or I can not even be there and the kid can figure out volleyball on their own, which is the way my sport was done for doubles. My dad played in the 40s. I played for 30 years. My son plays now. And the three of us, Kessels, have never had a coach. We just mentor and guide ourselves and play as partners and say, what's going on? What can we do to do this? Um, and we learn on our own, much like how you learn to ride a bike. And the reason the bike's so important is, A, did you <laughs> did your parents hire a bike riding coach, even though you can die learning to ride a bike? And the answer, of course, was no. Did they do bike riding drills? And except in the very extreme variants of a drill sergeant, <laughs> um, no, you never did a bike riding drill. Did you do bike riding progressions? No. And did you go to bike riding summer camp? No. You learn to ride the bike intrinsically. And why that is so much about learning is that you may not ride a bike for two years, but because you intrinsically learned it, you can still ride it immediately. That said, specificity is a huge part about practicing for practice versus performance and why we want to work on performance. Specificity is seen very clearly in a highly recommended video to watch called The Backwards Bike. Um, multiple millions of views on YouTube. This guy has one thing change on his bike. The handlebar goes right and the wheel goes left, and he can't ride the bike for eight months, even though he's ridden a bike for decades. So specificity is tied into this as well. We want to be as specific as possible in the learning process. So um, all of this said, uh, I really highly suggest you Google Gawande and read some of the stuff he's done in the New York Times or his books. This book, uh, the performance word is in it, of course. Um, better, a note, Serge's notes on performance. And in there he says why we're so focused at USA Volleyball and motor learning science and why I go help baseball and major league and pole vault, the US pole vaulting and, and, um, Gosh, synchronized swimming, USA shooting, you know, that it's motor learning. It's, it's not volleyball learning. And that spawned a guy being trained, uh, Trevor Reagan, who has a website called Train Ugly. When he came and watched me coach basketball, he said that, or coach volleyball, he said, this is working basketball. And I said, yeah, it's motor learning. And he's done a really good job with his site. So what, what Gwande says here, we have not effectively used the abilities that science has already given us and made adequate efforts to change that. That's what I'm hoping you can use this presentation to get your sport to make those changes um, because they're so important. This slide, it's some variation, is an important one for all programs, parents and players included. Um, we tend to think that success is linear. I'm riding up this path to the to the gold flag, you know, and it's not. It's got all these backwards movements and things like that that we have to worry about. So one of the recipients of learning by playing and learning through games and learning through the reality of, of volleyball is my son. This is a picture of him blocking on number five on the right side. He's in his fourth year playing professionally overseas. But yeah, of course, I work at USA Volleyball. This kid did 10 sports growing up, and so did his sister. So I'm coming at it from a parent point of view as well, not just a, a scientist point of view. I strongly suggest when you do just about any clinic that you found these are motor learning principles that we're kind of chomping on about how to get from practicing just to practice to performance. 
And this quote in both Spanish and English is a primary use slide for me, which is about principles first before methods. Of course, it starts with the, the classic part about growth mindset and effort over outcome that we like to also present to kids. And so in this effort over outcome, you, of course, have uh, without work, one finishes nothing. Without ambition, one starts nothing. You, you, the prizes are going to be sent to you. You have to win it, of course. Then the man who knows how will always have a job. The man who also knows why will always be his boss. That leads me to the really, I believe, important area of the player who knows why beats the player who knows how in motor learning science. That's part of intrinsic learning, that you've guided their discovery to the why and not just the how. And so all this rolls back to principles. Um, and as the methods, there may be a million and then some of the principles are few. If you grasp principles, you can select your own methods. So I'm here to take principles. Now, why this blows me away is that this coach that's saying this is Ralph Waldo Emerson back in the 1800s. <laughs> um, he was spot on, and we use his insights, even though they're 100 years old plus, to um, guide us to be focusing on the principles so that we can do our own methods. So here's a problem in my sport. The net is a regulatory stimuli. Each of our sports has a thing that a foil, the, the lane that are regulatory stimuli that regulates how we play our sport or do our sport. In my sport, it's the net. But in my sport, coaches want to make practice look so good then that they ignore the net sometimes for almost an entire practice. That's what's happening here. This is a beach doubles clinic at our American Volleyball Coaches Association gathering. And this is an hour into the training. And as you can see, all these coaches that I'm not letting you see who did it, but all these people haven't touched the other side of the net. Even though in the game, the regulatory stimuli of the net is equally important to the ball, and those are the two things that matter. You know? The court is not as important because we change court size, but the net will always be there, and the ball's always got to be flying around and not held. So to, to ignore the net makes me really frustrated, but people do that so their practices look good. And so we have this saying that, you know, this is a sign you put up on your, on your gym that you can't use the court without using the net because the time is only two hours long and then you don't have the net. You can do these other no net things in your sport someplace else, but make it as game-like as possible. Um, we know that environment shape behavior and that repetitions matter. So here is an example of creating smaller court games to get a lot of reps. And in this case, it's rather than the one net, there's four smaller nets. And we can put 32 kids getting a doubles experience on here rather than the four kids that take over the whole court or the eight if they play a game we call speedball. Um, so our national team buys into this and Karch Three year or three gold medal or yeah, three gold medals of plan um, is now giving back to our sport by coaching and he won a silver uh, lost in the semis 15 13 after their number one player went down with a knee injury um, so he's back to see if in Tokyo we can finally get the first woman's gold medal you see the women in our culture tend to be drill based and coach powered. And our men are more game-based and player-empowered, with the coach providing the feedback but not running any drills. And Karch has made that shift along with the help of his former head coaches, Hugh McCutcheon, who won the gold medal in 2008, and then by saying, science has shaped everything we do in the gym. All the science says that most learning, or about motor learning here, takes place uh, when the practice looks like an actual game, which is really random and not super controlled. Um, so we're trying to get, you know, we're getting the most transfer we can get. And that's this, what in practice 
shows up in the game. That's called transfer. And we know a lot of things about that that we didn't know 10, 20 years ago. Um, this is a simplified motor learning chart. Um, I have another one coming up a little bit later, but this one basically says you see it, then you do it, and then you get feedback intrinsically and extrinsically. You and I are extrinsic. Internal is better. That's just riding the bike. So feedback is better when it's specific. Feedback is better when it's immediate. And that happens, of course, in intrinsic feedback. Always. And it's better when we guide their discovery. So I'm going to flesh that out a little bit more because it's so important. I tell you what to do. That's extrinsic. You figure it all out by yourself. That's intrinsic. Our role is to guide their discovery to intrinsically figuring it out. You have this great wisdom. You can just say quickly, do this. But that is remembered worst and problem-solving new things worst of all things. Since learning it yourself is, takes time, <laughs> our way of guiding discovery through your questions and your guided discovery of things that they sh you know that they shouldn't be told the answer but figure it out themselves may take four or five steps, but once they process it. It's as it, almost as good in learning and problem-solving new things as if they figured it out themselves. Passing the ball and then turning and looking at the coach shows me that you haven't guided their discovery enough, and we need to be guiding discovery a lot more in every sport listening. Having said that, my weakest thing as a younger coach was specificity and being specific. So as a young coach, I would say, way to go. That's it. Good job. I might even have said, Sam, nice try. <laughs> but now I say, way to go. Cheap, that was a cheap shot, John. <laughs> that was a cheap shot at me. Yeah, from our little clinic in Baltimore at U.S. Lacrosse the last couple of days. Um, but – if I say, way to go, Sam, comma, fill in the blank with specificity, the way you swung your arm faster. Now I'm being specific. They studied John Wooden, probably the greatest sports coach, a.k.a. teacher we've ever had in any sport. Seventy-six percent of what he said was specific wording. We need, all of us listening, need to be better at specificity and being specific in our wording. Um, but our wording stops being being so much telling them as it can be more guiding their discovery, and that's a big part of this specificity as well. There's another big thing in here called variance, and variance is seen here in an Olympic match in Rio. The target is clear. It's where the darkest red bars are. That's where we always want to serve receive to so that the setter has made these contacts where the balls are and but if you look at them they're spread out like a bell curve both right to left and actually front to back based on to the net and this doesn't show anything about the balls that went over the net because some did so this bell curve of variance that exists in other people's sports it means that sometimes you play above your average sometimes you play below your average because you have this mean that you're uh, attempting with a coach's guidance and performance enhancements to move up to be not such a wide variance pattern of the bell curve, but also not as low as the mean is, but raise it up to a higher level of success in every sport that we do. So I've written a couple of blogs about the importance of variance that I um, are part of motor learning as well. In our sport and many of your sports, uh, probably less in swimming, but hugely important in, in fencing for Sam, for example, is the most important skill is reading. It's predicting and brain, the game trains the brain webinar uh, would allow you to get a lot more ideas beyond what we're going to be able to do today uh, from a free up on the USA website. Uh, just type in the game, game trains the brain, Bain Kessel of webinar, and it should show up. So the key line that we want to take away from this time together is what we see determines how we move and how we learn. 
That's what we see. So it has to be training in the most reality base that we can for the transfer to have a chance to happen. When I worked with the Indians, they were doing a bunch of catcher things off of a machine with all the other catchers standing around waiting for their turn. And I said, has the catcher ever thrown back to the pitcher, back to first base to try and get the guy out or get the guy out and, and for second? And they, in all cases, they say, no, never in the history of the game has there not been a batter. I said, well, why isn't one of these catchers standing there being a batter and doing what batters do to bug a catcher while they practice catching. I don't understand. You've got to train in reality, and that's a reality that you have to have. As soon as we did, their performance dropped, and then the coach was able to coach a lot more accurately in his guided discovery and questions to the players because we added reality. So reading is really important, and we see that here. Um, and the same question, this is a five-time Olympian who has technically beautiful form. However, she misread the ball, and so did the other kid here. Um, so we want to be thinking about our sports. How do I guide discovery of being a better reader in our sport? This is a huge topic in our national team gym, for sure. Um, on a lot of levels. I said reps matter, and that's because you learn by doing, not by watching. If you learn the motor skill by watching, then every kid getting into the car at 16, including my two kids, would know how to drive. But they don't know how to drive, even though they've watched for decades, until they drive. And my insurance rates show it, and they start off really high, and they drop as, as they learn to drive by doing driving. And driving, of course, is very specific and game-like when you hit the road. So they give you the core ideas in a parking lot where your errors of variance won't hit a car. And as you learn to control the car better in this parking lot where you have lots of room, then they scare you and <laughs> you go out onto the road where reality is now a new reality that lanes are only so wide and there's no space between you and you have to stay in your lane and you have to accelerate and brake and you have to pay attention. Ultimately, this becomes what they say in motor learning autonomous. You probably drove to your work to listen to this talk and didn't think about shifting and turning the signals and all the things that you had to really think hard about. That's our goal, of course, in this whole process, becoming autonomous. So a question that we have to ask ourselves is what is a fundamental technique? And as time goes on, I hope more of us realize that there may be core pieces to it that you need to jump off the ground, but maybe you don't have to jump the same way other people do, and maybe because you jump differently or swing differently or do these things differently, as long as it's not injurious to your limbs, it, it's, a, it's a way that's harder to read and not, you know, it's something that will let happen and unfold as long as it's safe physically. Um, so all this, for me, comes down to this kind of huge chart. And I'm going to, um, I think I can open this up a little bit now. So... I have a, a talk with the late Dr. McGowan that covers some of this. I've been talking about stuff that's not in our McGowan talk. Um, but using that same triangle of see it, do it, talk to yourself internally, or get feedback from the coach externally, um, we know these things that matter, and that's on the screen. And so this is a whiteboard at one of my Motor Learning Chalk Talks um, did a very similar broken out one when I worked with the Indians. Um, but I'm going to just review some of them quickly. Words have little meaning to beginners in motor skill learning. Um, we do a lot of ways to show that, and a lot of videos on America's Finance Home videos would show that as well. The goal we present in what we call four by four, four cues, each skill max, and max of four words that are the cue words positively phrased to what 
we want to see happen. That gives a framework, but we want to let the technique slash their individual body fit within those frameworks, but maybe you only need three. And the reason it's so short is because the more you know, the more you tell them, then the more you confuse them. So we need to simplify. Um, simple is better than complex. There's another slide here a little bit later. Um, we also know that I hear and I forget it, I see and I remember it, and I do it and I understand it. So when we do clinics, we get as many of our coaches out doing it rather than watching it being done because they understand it far better. Um, and finally, the goal is that it's presented through more stories instead of facts. Humans remember facts better when they're woven into stories. So telling stories about a technique and things would make you even a better guy, uh, person in presenting the ideas. Anybody should be able to demonstrate the skill without their the ball or without an opponent, whatever makes it you not look good technically. So when we say to volleyball coaches, we, it's great that you might be a player, but you don't have to be a player. You just have to be able to show athletes of every age the technique that's preferred to be the center of their variance and how that looks and then let them discover their own solutions and you guide their discovery. Um, when we jump over to skill, this is where the research is really the rubber hits the road. Um, so in skill, here's the mistakes I made as a young coach. I said you had, yeah, I gotta learn to play tired. Do you know we have a $27 million athlete recovery center essentially, basically at the OTC now, so that you don't go to your next practice tired, so you're never learning to play tired. Everything you, you learn best when you're not tired. Fatigue is detrimental to learning. This is about learning more effectively. So if you're going to fatigue someone in your sport, you got to do it at the end of the learning practice, not anywhere in the middle and believe in what I used to believe that you have to learn to play tired. We have a culture of play as part of the skill. Skill will develop um, a lot better when kids play without a coach. We see that in volleyball doubles, Misty May and Karch Karai didn't even play our six-person game until they were teens. They played doubles against adults with their parents. Um, in the research in soccer schools, they found that the difference between pro and non-pro signees out of the soccer academy wasn't the nutrition, wasn't the technique training, wasn't all. It was the amount of time the kids played street soccer without a coach and problem solve things on their own again. Um, there's no such thing as muscle memory. So after this time together, I hope you bite your tongue every time you say muscle memory. Your your biceps don't have little uh, cerebellum in them. There's no brains in your, in your muscles anywhere. Um, this is all about how the game trains the brain. And the big ones that you'll have to struggle with with coaches who want to practice for practice and not to get better at their performance are the two terms of whole versus part and random versus blocked. And I, anybody can email me at john.kessel at usav.org, that's K-E-S-S-E-L, um, and I will send you a 25-page paper about the superiority of random over blocked and whole over part training that uh, is a response with tremendous amount of research to help guide our coaches to be comfortable with making the change to the fact that random training is going to look uglier. That's what was said in our gym that Trevor said, does Karch says train ugly? Can I use that term? You know? um, we, we also say chaos a lot because our Olympic women's team is out of out of a system 48% of the time. 48%. So the research says training game-like in any sport more chaotically, randomly, 
is superior to learning and problem solving new things. Back to the same stuff. Now, out of all this, we, we want to get the reps, so that's why we do a lot of two on two and smaller sided games, and why I think basketball is going to see another jump in skill when the Olympic three on three game starts to see people cross over. Um, to the indoor six five on five game, um, pretty important to be able to be comfortable with the chaos and know that they are learning and remembering better by forgetting and having to problem solve again. What blocked training is is when you shoot it or do it in a row, so you look good. And I was talking to the PGA guy Ted at this ADM thing Sam and I were at the last two days. And he was saying that, you know, guys like Davis Love and Tiger Woods and Jack Nicklaus all follow the speed first, accuracy second. But he also was saying, when I said, why are we, you know, you should go to a driving range and play a round of golf on the driving range. And he says, our top pros are starting to see that that promotes better learning and transfer into performance. So they, too, are starting to do that. And that a couple of their people, I think it was Davis Love also said, I, I play a game. I imagine that I'm playing a game. Well, when you don't hit the driver 20 times in a row until it feels good, but instead do what in the game is, I hit the driver, then three holes later I hit a driver once, in my case twice because I shank it <laughs> out, to the, uh, out of bounds and have to hit it a second time. Um, but I only hit it three times, you know, before I'm somewhere out, out there on the course. The that is random training versus block, which you see at the driving range where they do so much. Now, is there learning happening in block? Yes, but it's not as effective at remembering it, and it's not, this is all research says and everything, and it's not as effective at problem solving new stuff. And those two things matter a huge amount in our, in our life and sport. So, All the things of the skill lead us to us, you and me, feedback. The person that guides discovery, so it's more intrinsic feedback, and the person who gives other feedback and other things. So I already said be specific. Um, I've always talked about solutions, not problems, so that's a pretty important thing. Um, in our feedback, you see try, but, and don't all crossed out. And we talked about that again at the uh, ADM. Um, there are three words that in your feedback should be not said. You, you never want to say don't. You want to say this is what you should be solution-oriented. This is what you should be showing. Of course, we also should say show me rather than tell me. It's great that it, when a kid says tells you what they should have done, you say, great, now show me. And... I'm going to throw in something that's not on the slides at all. Put the player's name last when you teach anything beyond individual sport. What does that mean? There's a huge difference between saying this. Sam, when you blah, should you blah or blah? Sam? Well, obviously it's blah. But look at the difference now. You guys, when we blah, should we blah or blah? Sam? You see, when I talk to my kids and I put the player's name last, it doesn't allow everybody to go, oh, good, Sam has to answer this and I'm out. They have to be engaged in the practice, the deliberate practice, the learning that we're doing in the, in the training. So put the player's name last is a big one. Um, we use a whiteboard all the time, three whiteboards on the national team's gyms uh, because it's a tool for more effective, faster learning. Um, we have learned a lot from what's called optimal theory. And I don't know, Sam, whether we can shoot it out to them or share them a link or whatever, but if you guys Google 
optimal learning theory. Um, you should be able to see some of the research on this that's coming out of Las Vegas, University of Las Vegas, uh, Dr. Wolf, Gabriel Wolf, W-U-L-F. Um, her research is saying that our feedback should be far less on the body, internal versus intrinsic, and more external on everything that's out there. So it's easy to get external with a fence foil or an APE or whatever you guys do, Sam, and to talk about the ball flight. But we've got to stop talking as much about anything in, inside the body or the not just inside. I don't mean heart type stuff. I'm talking about finger, foot, elbow, arm. Um, part of that's so that they can come up with their own body movement solutions based on the core technique that you've shown, but it's mostly because the way the brain is wired, when you make them think about a body part, instead of letting that just happen naturally, it slows down the learning and slows down the problem solving of new things. Back to that same thing. So she's done some great research in all sports, and there's a blog on my website, or the USA Volleyball website called a major change in my feedback that will give you the links and the downloads, and I highly recommend it because it lets us go faster through this topic. Um, you know, catch them being good in your feedback. Most coaches turn their radar on and then walk up and only when you're making an error. Uh, the late Tony DiCicco, he you know, 96 Olympic team, gold medal for women's soccer. His whole goal was to catch them being good. He wrote a book about it. Um, highly recommended it. You can get it on at low price on Amazon. Um, the, the yes, yes, no, no is between you and me as a player coach. I'm going to say, did you do it right that time? And they say yes, and we're in sync, that's good. If I'm going to say, did you do it right this time, and you're thinking no, and they say no, that's good. When we guide discovery and ask questions all the time, when you say, see a time that they did it right, and you say, did you do it right that time, and they say no, you need to spend extra time with that athlete. And when you ask, did you do it right that time because they didn't, and they say yes, you have to, again, guide their discovery to why you know it's a no so they can problem solve it on their own. So, you know, these are all key parts about learning. And getting out of this diagram into some of the more science that's out there, um, you know, these are some research about the, the way – Learning takes place on remembering it. Uh, some really good documents there that you, I suggest you, you know, I can send to you. Um, sorry, these are about, <laughs> we don't want them to be soldiers in practice and then be an artist on the weekend. I thought Stuart Armstrong nailed it there. Learning in practice should be still learning about the art of, of playing the game the way you see Ronaldo. Now, um, one of the other videos highly recommended is that you go to YouTube and discover is uh, type Ronaldo Castro Oil BBC, and you'll see a 45-minute video on where he looks to read, and then my favorite one is where they corner kick to him and they turn the lights out halfway and he still can do the whole skill. He doesn't see the ball for half the flight, but he can still do the whole skill because reading what's out there teaches you what the last part is going to actually do. So another highly recommended video. Um, when I typed in, as you can see, volleyball drills into Google, I got 32 million <laughs> results. And our national team does only about a dozen what we call grills, game-like grills. We do, however, highly recommend it into your sports, and you can download my free mini volleyball book, which has 30 pages of scoring variations. Um, 
because we take something that is reality-based and it's like the game and all we change is the scoring, not the, the make it less game-like so practice looks better. We make it stay game-like with the net in the way and the antennas up, not down, and all these other things we have to have when we play and smaller side of game so we get more reps, but we change the scoring in dozens, hundreds of ways. So we don't have these gimmicks either. Um, as I said, drills are the drugs of coaches. So the late Schmidt's book, I pulled this quote out because I, given this topic, I thought it was of value. The drills and lead-up activities take considerable amount of practice time and do not produce much transfer, so use them sparingly in later practice stages. That's why we play so many full or part total games with scoring differences. And this one really frustrates the ladder runners and the gimmick people. It is fruitless to train fundamental abilities such as quickness and balance. So concentrate on this fundamental skills instead. Um, pretty important stuff. I think this applies to all our sports. Uh, Brazil great players. They're one of the the U.S. and Brazil are the only two countries to be to every Olympics and medal uh, since 1984. Uh, it's not Japan, which a lot of people think, or Russia. It's the USA and Brazil. And they, their best players said, my first coach is the game. And I really, really like that. I'm showing this slide because I'm wondering if in fencing, Sam, let's, let's get you involved because I've been doing a stream of consciousness here. Um, in fencing, how would a what's a good mistake in fencing versus a bad mistake as they strive to be perfect in doing a skill? These dogs presenting you an example of it's better to air over the target of the barbed wire too high than it is too low. They're both errors, too low and too high. Is there is there positive and negative errors in fencing in, in a skill movement? Wow, good question. Um, is it better to go too fast in versus too slow? Or is it better to hit high than low? Is it better to um, hit the body rather than an arm? Well, you know, they're both errors or not errors. Or is it better to miss the arm than the body? <laughs> Well, we're getting a little technical. Each weapon has a different target area. So in Epe, it's any part of the body. It's open season. So hitting the foot counts a point just as hitting the torso does. But in foil, it's torso only. So in that case, hitting the arm does you no good. Um, so that that's not a positive error in there. Probably the one thing I can maybe think of is if you're aiming for like the upper right quadrant but you hit the upper left quadrant, it's it, you didn't hit what you're aiming at, but you got a you would get a point out of it assuming everything else is done correctly. Versus the arm would have been not a point to the correct. The right arm is not a point, but the correct. Okay, yeah, see that would in, be in, a, a it great depends upon the weapon, but yes. Sure. Yep. Yeah. And that's also variance based, you know, when we say um, aim at the line, hit the line, then half of your balls go out of bounds wide. So we move the target in from the line so everything stays inside the court. You don't want to serve over the net or aim at the net, you know, clear the top of the net because half of your variance errors are going to go below the net. In, in this positive and negative concept, the good mistake is that it goes out of bounds long, and the bad mistake is it goes into the net. And because into the net, nothing good will ever happen. But out of bounds, they might touch it the, by mistake. The line judge will still call it in even though it's out. And in practice, in my sport, when you hit out, spiking or serving, the team that's receiving learns what out is. They don't you got to read an out ball just like you got to read an in ball. But when you serve into the net, nobody's learning anything. They don't get a chance to make a decision, and we're all about decision-making, you know. That's part of what's going on is making faster decisions. The cortex, the performance cortex book has, you know, essentially what they're doing is they're 
reading what the brain's decision-making speeds are by the gear that they're able to put on, and they're able, they're saying there's going to be not too long time from now that we're going to be able to say, why does this amazingly good-looking physical athlete not bat well enough? He's got all the looks that a scout would, you know, bring in, but his, he's never become a great batter because his decision-making is too slow in his brain. And that may in part be genetic. And, and, and what they're seeing is that the decision-making slowness ties into the batting averages of the people they've been studying. So, I don't know, I think it's some kind of fun stuff. Um, Hawk says some great stuff. Simple, clear purposes and principles give rise to complex intelligent behaviors. Complex rules and regulations give rise to simple, stupid behaviors. We think that's pretty important. Um, love searching John Holt, um, a musician who talks about, you know, how you play. You don't start to learn to play and then play the cello. The whole, it's all a process. That's why at the beginning you want to play. And, you know, you learn to do something by doing it, not by learning a piece and then learning to play the piece or whatever. Um, so highly recommended to read some quotes by him. Here's the gym word changes to, and the reason I love Sisu. Uh, some of the listeners may never have learned about SISU. Uh, highly recommended that you do. Go look at what they're doing up there in Finland and some of the other areas. Um, our critical mission is to always improve and success, celebrate the success of those around us and come up with these new decisions so we and we embrace adversity there we consider the adversity in training an opportunity to improve that's that culture shift that Ann Coyle's great culture code book just out um, also ties into the kind of things that we have to do so at the very bottom being good at something is about mistakes and retention um, here is some specificity from that document you can get from me uh, training is specific. This principle may suggest there's no better training than actually performing the sport. Uh, here's the examples I've said of uh, being specific, and in Europe they call it um, being Americano. <laughs> um, notice that I've said feed forward here, and that's a shift in the last few years because feedback is seen as criticism. You can't control the past. You can only control the future. So, you know, that's important to us as well. Um, and you might want to pause this because I want to stay on time and have time for questions. This slide is what happens with coaches giving up on the kind of random and training and chaotic training and non-blocked but whole training. And therefore, they fail to progress as fast as possible. And we've already talked about controlling variance. This is a part of that optimal learning theory by Dr. Wolf. This kid, when told to put her finger on the board rather than see the board go as high as you can and didn't talk about body parts, the kid jumped about three inches higher when the finger was eliminated from the process. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, oops, sorry. Some research, again, on this internal versus external focus, both from a retention and a problem-solving, new ideas, learning faster. But a few years ago, we didn't know the importance or how much retention was mattering. And so finally, some new studies have said that, for example, here, um, Block versus random, while it looks better in practice, the retention is worse. And that's why you got to be comfortable with the chaos, <laughs> because they remember all the things you're teaching better. Um, it's pretty hard for some people to deal with, but that's what we know. This is the research on street soccer and other sports, doubles volleyball without any coach. And, um, again, another national team whiteboard example. 
because it belongs in your training. Um, so we're going to close on what summary feedback is, and that is, as you see, if I stay on them and feedback every time versus what we often say, coach on the averages, and in coaching on the averages, I see you do it five times. One right, four wrong. I need to give you information and solutions on the wrong. But if you see him do it three times right and two wrong, or four times right and one wrong, your feedback, your con, your talking should be about what they did right. That's the whole catch and being good by Tony. Why? Because it's better retention. <laughs> Can't say that enough. Um, so in the end, kids learn to make decisions by making decisions, not by being told what to do. Um, practicing for practice. I have parents that see our warm-up before a game, which is chaotic and game-like still because it's another chance, 10 minutes or five minutes to get better at volleyball, so we make it game-like even though we're getting ready to play a match. We may narrow the constraints down, this idea of constraints-based learning and stuff. We may say, look, the ball needs to go pretty close to your teammate during a warm-up, but it still has to be a game-like thing to read, and it still has to come over the net. It isn't thrown by the coach to the setter. The setter handles passes from teammates who are wanting to hit that pass and then hit. So rather than let it go anywhere, we say get it near them, and then they perform the whole skill um, of passing, setting, hitting, because we have Mark Dunphy, our gold medal coach in 88, said, since we learned that's from things that are game-like, the ideal hitting drill is a pass, set, hit drill. The ideal setting drill is a pass, set, hit drill. The ideal passing drill is a pass, set, hit drill. And I made the mistake of doing way too many digging drills. Look, we look so good at digging. And then in a game, we couldn't dig, set, kill it. I was practicing for practice and not for performance. So there's lots of other examples. I wanted to give a chance for people to question in or Sam to question me or whatever. Um, you can reach me on Twitter at John Kessel USAV. You can reach me on USA Volleyball here. And I think Mary... Um, you know, Maya Angelou, when she went out, uh, sadly, a few years ago, her most powerful statement is, they won't forget, you know, they'll forget what you said and what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that's part of the emotional intelligence of a good coach. Um, in the gym, to get more performance, working with the athletes individually, uniquely, and make sure, sure that they feel good. That's why Karch says we want to celebrate our teammates' successes more than our own, and if we can't, then maybe we don't want to be on this team. Now, said, that's called Fire Thanks. Hose Motor Learning 101. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, again, a reminder, if uh, you have a question or comment and you want to make it, uh, if you'll just uh, – Type it in a little chat bubble there, then I can uh, I'll unmute you so you can ask that question. Um, but I'm going to kick one off here because this is one that has been bugging me for a while. And now that baseball season is upon us, I'm actually watching a little bit of baseball this year for the first time in a while. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's and, and since you've worked with a few baseball teams, I'm this is the other reason I'm throwing this out. What's the purpose of like batting practice before a game? Yeah, it seems like um, grooving pitches is really not going to help you hit better when the guy is going to throw a changeup and then he's going to throw your curveball, then he's going to throw your slider, then he's going to throw your forcing ball. It's going to come high, it's going to come low. This is not the 1880s where the rules actually allowed the batter to tell the pitcher where he wanted the ball to be thrown. Um, and it's just that's that it lately has driven me nuts, and maybe it's because you planted the seed in my head to look at this kind of stuff. Well, and you're, I think you nailed nailed it on the head. Now let's use that nail hammer as an example <laughs> of variance first. You and I hit the nail on the head a hundred times. We think we're doing pretty good, but if you flip over the head of the hammer and put a sensor device on it and nail the next one hundred. 
it'll show the pattern of a bell curve in your inaccuracies as you're hammering. Mm -hmm. So batting practice is simply the chance to get traditional confidence in the batters that believe they need it currently. That said, the pitching machines that they use for practicing bunting. Now, let me throw another idea that I worked with the Indians on a lot. Stop standing in line. <laughs> That's a blog. You can read my Stop Standing in Line blog. But in every sport, since you learn best by doing, we've got to come up with ways in the precious amount of time to do more in the reality-based ways of our sport. So the Indians had a machine and I think nine people on each at each at the plate, one bat bunting and the other eight waiting to bunt. Now the randomness is so important and their game likeness is so important that the first things they've done is they raised the pitching machine to release the spun ball at the normal average height of a release of a pitcher because batting machines have always been down at kind of like as if you're throwing things by your waist. Well, the best, it's about waist level, yeah, because it's easy to feed yeah. the balls in that way, the person who's well, feeding the balls in, yeah. That's, that's, again, practicing or practice and not for performance. Yep. So they raise the, you know, so why not raise the machines up to release it by a pitcher, which they've done, as, the, as we should. But they've got machines now that they are getting used that randomize the pitches because one of the most famous motor learning studies in baseball is about randomized versus block training. The batters who got, like your old 1800 rules, you're going to get 15 curveballs now, 15 um, sliders, and now 15 fastballs, look better in practice compared to the guys that got the same number of pitches, 45 as I recall, but they were all um, buried. You never knew which was coming. They got the same number of each scale, but they were totally randomized. When they went to performance, though the batters in practice look worse with this randomized batting of pitching, the trained randomly guys outperformed in batting average the ones who were trained in a row. Yep. yep. So continuing your question, I think batting practice is simply about building the confidence that I've had need or want before I go to perform. And it's simply a lost learning opportunity. Yeah. The transfer is minimal from what you see in that kind of experience. And the thing that I am amazed at about baseball, as I forgot, you know, if we say the game trains the game, like, because it does, think about baseball compared to other sports. Like in World League Volleyball, we get 16 matches in our Volleyball Nations League coming up in Lincoln, Nebraska in a couple of weeks for the women and the men play and everything. So that's our season. What is baseball season? Yeah, 162, 162 games. games, plus spring training games, which I yeah, can't remember how many of those games. are. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's any sport that is learning to play the game by playing the game and attempting to – and therefore getting away from the things spring training and drilling might have done, it's baseball because they learn to play the game by playing the game. Now – what spring training then is about is how do you get more effective in that amount of time? And that goes back to creating more stations in your gym, as we did down at spring training. There was a batting practice going on a few, like 20 yards away from where they had been bunting in a row in long lines. And I said, um, 
can half these batters that are standing around waiting, sharing, and you know, standing in line at the batting cage, can they go over to the machine and do the bunting that they should have done or could have done this morning? Can they do more of it over there and eliminate the bunting line that you had so that everybody rotates through that and they, you still get more bunting done, but you get more learning in the same amount of time? And the answer was, of course, yes, we can do that, you know. So this this sort of shift of learning to do things randomly and game-like, they now have a machine in your batting practice that's going to throw things out randomly, not always the same. Very good. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any questions here in the question bubble, but I'm going to double check and make sure that I didn't click on it by mistake. Um, John, I want to thank you because our time is uh, kind of up here, and I've I've tried to keep these as, or no, I'm oh, sorry. You what? I know, dang it. You know, I think that I have a reaction to that now just because it, <laughs> it aggravates you. I think there's some sort of a feedback loop in there that allows for that. Uh, I I I'm 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 working on on this skill, and I I I'm doing what I can to uh, keep these to an hour. And I appreciate your time and sharing this stuff with you. I know several people on this call have heard you give these talks before, but I think this is one of those that repetition really does help, even even in areas like this. And well, and I, hopefully, I brought. I know I brought some new stuff, including yes. this book, the Performance Cortex, is only out for two weeks now. So yeah, um, and I will. I will also say that I will. Uh, I've I found one of Wolf's papers here from 2016, and I'll share it with the group. And, Great. Uh, and and do that, and I'll, I'll see if I can find a couple of uh, other papers too. It, as everybody knows, sometimes finding the full paper can be challenging, but I've got some I've got some ways around that that hopefully I can find and get the papers downloaded um, and shared with people with that. So with that, I will uh, again thanks John and John's email thank address you, is there, and I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, uh, Craig Jones from USTA there. We spent uh, some time with some of your good folks uh, up at U.S. Lacrosse. Uh, Craig, it was great to hear what you guys at tennis are doing. And uh, I, I think several of us walked away going, wow, that's some really cool stuff. Um, so that was a, a fun charity event. So, um, so your folks who came up did a really nice job with that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end our recording here. And uh, again, thanks everyone for joining us today.